Hey everybody, back again, the Steelers Chat, another episode with Josh Carney from Steelers Depot. How are you doing today? Happy holidays. I'm good. Happy holidays. Thank you for having me on again. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for coming through. I mean, did you watch the game? I know you watched the game. How are you feeling about, what were your first feelings about the game um, going into it? And then what were your feelings after the Raiders matchup last week? Going in, you know, I felt pretty good. And then obviously the the Franco Harris news hit. And yeah. uh, I think all of our collective thoughts were with the Harris family and the game, in a sense, didn't really mean as much. Um, but, you know, once the ball kicked off Saturday night, Christmas Eve, it was like, OK, this is Steelers Raiders. You know, this game is very important uh, for the black and gold. And, and uh, through three and a half quarters, I was like, this is not good. I know that uh, when Chris Boswell missed his first field goal, I think I had tweeted like, if Boswell is missing field goals at home, it's going to be a really long night. And uh, sure enough, it was. Uh, but hey, they're they're seven and eight. They're right in this thing. You know, you look back week eight, they lose in blowout fashion to the I believe it was the Eagles. And it's they're two and six seasons over, you know, just playing to see the young kids at this point. Flash forward to now they're seven and eight. They've got two division rivalry matchups coming up, and they've got a shot at not only the playoffs, but uh, extending Mike Tomlin's non-losing season streak to, to 16. So just yeah. remarkable what this team has done in a transition year. I mean, when when other franchises go through a transition, they're typically well under 500, picking in the top 10. And uh, the Steelers have have found a way to to get back to near 500 and, and have meaningful football in late December, early January. So just a, a remarkable job what these guys have done. And uh, I think that showed Christmas Eve. Yeah, it, it was just one of those wins that just makes it what makes you feel good, but you can tell it kind of just, it's like a wave. It's, it's going to send waves through the whole organization, a glimmer of hope. It was electric. It was an electrifying win. Yeah. Um, and that defense, Oh man. I feel like every time I give them just incredible praise, they kind of fall flat the, the next game. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, like the, the game against the Bengals. Um, there was another, what was the other game? I mean, just when the defense comes out, it plays phenomenal. I, I need to see it twice. I need to see it back to back. Um, and and they did do it. They did do it back to back. They did win Carolina and they played really, really good. And they came home and they played really well, only allowing 10 points. That's that's great. That's awesome. Um, and I need to see it again. I yeah. need to see it. <laughs> you know, that, that first drive from the Raiders, they went right down the field and it was like, okay. Like, I, yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> like, it's like, okay, an emotional letdown is coming. You know, a lot of players were emotional throughout the week. Things have been pretty heavy for the franchise and, you know, the Raiders are coming in a little juiced up that first drive, you know, the Steelers get bullied and it's like, yeah, I kind of have a feeling the way this is going. And then after that, nothing. They, um, yeah. They, they strapped it on. They strapped it on. They plugged up the, uh, the line. I mean, I, Devontae Adams was my biggest fear. Yeah. And he was really a non-factor. He was my biggest fear going to this game. I was like, okay. I know we're able to stop the run. I saw them do it last week. Now I'm worried about these corners. Now I'm worried about the secondary. Mm-hmm. And we didn't have Edmonds out there. I was shook. <laughs> yeah, when, when when he was ruled out, it was like, okay, they have DeMonte Casey. It's, it, it might be okay, but Edmonds is such a significant piece for this team. Uh, I, I sure hope that he is resigned, you know, re-signed right there with, with Cameron Sutton. Uh, yeah. But they did a fantastic job of, of – bracketing Devonte Adams really taking him away his longest catch on the day happened to be on a wheel route out of the backfield where he beat Robert Spillane for 14 yards so it wasn't like he beat the cornerbacks uh you know they had to design a touch for him to to have an impact and you know Hunter Renfro and and Darren Waller they had their impact don't get me wrong you know they mm-hmm. they both had four catches uh Waller had the big catch there late in the first half Renfro with the touchdown but you live with that. You, you, you know, the Steelers, they come into a matchup. They're going to take away your best ability. Yep. They will always do that. Uh, especially if you have a star, you know, they focused coming in on Devonte Adams on Josh Jacobs. And I think those two combined for what? 63 total yards. So they were I mean, really silent. That second half. 
Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. And it it was surprising that they didn't run the football in, in frigid temperatures as well as they have all year. But I think a lot of credit is due to the Steelers. You know, they talked all week leading into that game about getting off blocks and making plays against the run. And they, they did that. And uh, yeah, if you would have told me Devonte Adams finished that game with two catches for 15 yards, I, I would have wondered if you were drinking a, a, something yeah, was that like was spiked for the holidays, you know, like, like he wasn't playing the whole game. There's no way. <laughs> yeah, and, and they just did a phenomenal job. And, that last drive, that last scoring drive from, from the Steelers offense, you, you wonder where is that throughout the first three and a half quarters? Yeah. You know, and I think Steve Smith said it best. It, it's Matt Canada calls a game not to lose early on. You know, I don't, I don't think some of it's Saturday ish. I don't think it's college football like because half the NFL runs some of Canada's plays and, and vice versa, but right. it just feels like he calls a game so conservatively early on and then when all the chips are on the table the clock is winding down he's just like okay let's be aggressive here i i I, you have to find that balance the first three quarters i don't understand uh what the difference is in in methodology i I understand your opponent's different don't get me wrong i completely understand that people on the upper side of the field are different but if you look at the carolina game and what mitchell trubisky was able to do and then you come back you come home and it's just so different. The offense just plays significantly differently. I don't understand that. Um, and, you know, that's where my problem comes in. Is it purely I, – I don't think it's just one thing. I don't think it's just play calling. I don't think it's just execution. It's really a mix. And them just probably not being on the same page. I'm not saying that Mitch and Matt are on the same page, but I feel like Mitch has been able to execute it better. And there were a lot more running um, – you know, running attempts, rushing attempts than, uh, than last week, which is interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I think with- I, I, I just have to look at those numbers. I don't know them exactly, but it just seemed like we rushed more in Carolina. Than oh, for did. sure. For yeah. sure. Yeah. They, they tied a single game record in the Tomlin era for, for rushing attempts in a game. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the thing with Trubisky, when he comes into the game lately, at least like, so you think back the Tampa Bay game, when he came in in the second half for Kenny Pickett, he had nothing to lose. He had no, he, you know, he wasn't looking over his shoulder at that point. It was just come in and play football. Yeah. Uh, you, then you look at the game against the Ravens. He came in, nothing to lose. Nobody's behind him. They can't take him out for performance. So he's just going to cut it loose. Carolina was a little different. Uh, you know, obviously Mason Rudolph Mason was, was, was behind him. Yeah. You know, and, and, and uh, all week they had split first team reps, but he still was aggressive when he needed to be. I think with Pickett, it's there, but I think he is so focused on not turning the football over the way he did in the first half of the season where he mm-hmm. might be seeing some things downfield and he's just he hesitates just enough to say, okay, I'm not going to take that shot. I'm going to be conservative here. Check it Another down. Baller. Yeah, yeah. take take yeah. what the defense I, has given me. And, and that has to change because I think he's talented enough. I'm not, I'm not sold that he's a franchise quarterback. You know, I'm not sold that he's ever going to be top 10. I definitely don't think he's ever going to be one of those impactful top five to seven guys that just absolutely changes the league, but mm-hmm. you can win with him. And I think he can make all the throws. He just has to get out of this mindset of I'm not afraid to, to make a mistake, but I don't want to hurt my team by making a mistake. Like I did in the beginning of the year. Uh, you know, that, yeah. that final drive, I think he was really solid. Uh, the best play of that final drive was when he threw back across his body while scrambling and he, he lofted one to Pat Fryermuth back in the yes. middle of the field. And so that, that man right there, Pat Anger Muth, I don't understand how he went the whole Carolina game with no targets. I still like don't definitely yeah definitely on a snap count or a pitch count because he was dealing with the foot injury and yeah. I think they were just so focused on running you know they yeah running that you know Mike Tomlin challenged the offensive line that week like you guys win the game. And uh, there was never really a need for for the passing game to win that game for them. But yeah. man. I, I still, but he is so vital to the yes. offense. Yes, and, he is. Um, you cannot. You got to use him. You got to. You got to make him a threat out there. And um, as we kind of just segue into the Baltimore matchup, mm. um, I'll give a little bit of what I'm feeling uh run game because we we abandoned the run game uh, at, at one point when we first played Baltimore. Mm-hmm. Pat Fryermuth needs to be 
a, a major uh, major weapon in this game, as well as you know DJ and and G GP. We saw yeah. GP give Marlon Humphrey some problems. I mean, yes, the operation yeah. he was creating, like uh, even drew a penalty. I mean, we gotta exploit that. Um, and I don't know. Marlon's going to be ready for. I'm sure they're going to send Marcus Williams or whoever come, to come over and help. But uh, I'm, I'm excited about the matchup. How are you feeling about it? I feel <laughs> really, I, I I feel really good about it, especially considering how the last game went. I know it didn't go as expected defensively. Baltimore rushed for for 215 yards. Uh, you know, I think that's not going to happen again. Uh, there's been such an emphasis on it in the last two weeks, and we've seen. When these guys drill it and make it a priority, teams aren't going to run against them. Um, I'm not saying that they're going to hold the Ravens under 100 rushing yards, but I, I don't think we're going to see that 200-plus game from Baltimore where they just bully them. Uh, offensively, though, I feel really good because Kenny Pickett is not going to turn the football over the way Mitch Trubisky did in that game, uh, especially when they're in scoring position. I mean – I, I, I've said this and I've gotten some pushback on it because how can you determine that? But if Kenny Pickett is in that game, the Steelers win that game and they're sitting at, at eight and seven right now. Uh, you know, I, Pickett just doesn't make one. those mistakes. He just yeah, doesn't. That was a tough one. And, and just going back to your previous, previous point, my only fear with Kenny is him not making the plays and throwing yeah. the ball away and we settling for three or settling to punt when there's possibly a play there that could have been made. Um, and uh, Mitch was so good, gave us the energy that we needed, was fearless, and the interceptions just took over. I mean, yeah. we could have gotten three points out of any of those interceptions. That's, <laughs> that's the thing. So, that's you know, the that's thing. the game, right? Oh, it's that's, I mean, you, you take one interception away. And it's probably it, at, at minimum, it's a 17, 16 win for the Steelers. If everything else stayed the same, you know, and, and that's what was so frustrating out of that game because Trubisky was so good. It's just, they get down in the red zone and, you know, things kind of tighten up from the defense. There's not as, as much room to operate as there is between the twenties. And when it comes to the middle of the field, Trubisky just throughout his entire career does not see the middle of the field. Well, at all. At all. I mean, he doesn't look off. He locks onto targets and he doesn't see stuff. And, and with Pickett, I think the best part about his game right now is his ability to process and see the field and move defenders with his eyes. Uh, and, and I think that's going to be the key on Sunday night. And I'm, I'm a little disappointed. It's a Sunday night game because the Steelers could head into that matchup being eliminated and it meaning absolutely nothing. Um, so I'm, I'm a little worried about a slight letdown there, but Man, I'll I tell you what, national television, Steelers, Ravens, there's nothing better. And I think Pickett's really going to put a stamp on his place in this rivalry moving forward Sunday night. It's, I think, when you say meaning nothing, it always means something to this rivalry, yeah, right? For sure, yeah. You get bragging rights going into the next season. Um, and personally, I'm not in playoff mood. I'm not looking at the various scenarios. I want this team to just win. I just yeah. want them to win out. That's my focus. That's my, I know that's probably their focus. I know there's a small percentage and this needs to happen. For sure. But all they can control is going in there and winning. So I think that's what they have to do. And that's what I'm focused on. Uh, so for me, it's like the perfect game. I don't know why we've gone a couple of years without having Baltimore and Pittsburgh as primetime games. So I'm I'm all for it. I'm like, this is what the people should see. It's yeah. probably boring to everyone outside of the AFC North, to be honest. Oh, for sure. They for don't sure. want to see these battles. They're low scoring games. They come, but they come down to the wire. It's phenomenal football, but everyone wants to see splash plays. I just want, you know, all this excitement, and it's just not that. It's it's just hardcore football. When yeah, and, and I don't think people are going to get up for a Tyler Huntley, Kenny Pickett matchup at quarterback. Yes. But, I mean, you want to talk about defense, hard-hitting football, sound technique. Like, you're, you're going to get all of that Sunday night. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, historically, these games come down to, to one score, one possession. I don't know how you don't like that on a primetime game. I'd rather have a, a 13 10 matchup than a 45 17 blowout with a bunch yeah. of offensive plays. Like, that's 
that's not a better watch than a, a low scoring defensive battle where every play matters. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is a pivotal one. Like it, like I said, it might not matter when it comes to the playoffs, but these guys still have a lot to play for. You know, I get tired of hearing people bash on Tomlin's non-losing season. Thank streak. You. Yeah. Like, it is so impressive. He has passed. I believe it's Bill Walsh or no, I'm sorry. It's Marty Schottenheimer and Don Shula. Two legendary coaches who did the same thing to start their career. Tomlin does it, and it's, oh, it doesn't matter. What about the playoff success? Marty Schottenheimer very rarely had playoff success. He's a Hall of Fame caliber head coach. You know, he helped mold Bill Cowder. I don't I don't hear people complaining about Marty Schottenheimer's 14 seasons. They won't. And they no. won't. And and I and I hate I, I cannot stand a lot of the common criticism. Um, yes, I understand the laps and actual playoff wins. But do you know how hard it is to go through seasons without a, a star quarterback, you know, to to do things and then now having a transition from a, a star quarterback to a, a new rookie as your quarterback to have a winning season to win eight games, you know, or, you know, we're, we're at seven now. But to, to win those amount of games when your whole organization has gone through a huge transition it's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and this man is still motivating guys. Like you're yeah. doing whatever for a long time and you're motivating these guys to still go out there and win games. Yeah. I, I think not... Ryan Clark said it perfectly on, on get up this morning. Tomlin's message doesn't change from week one to, you know, preparing for the Super Bowl. You know, he, they prepare the same way. It's the same message. There is stability there. And, and anytime I hear people, criticize Tomlin or want to make a change. It's like, okay, who are you getting to replace him? Yep. How are you going to change the coaches around him? Because historically the Steelers have one of the smallest coaching staffs in the NFL every year. They yep. have one of the smallest budgets when it comes to the coaching staff every year. That's why you don't see these flashy coordinator hires. You know, they, they promote from within, they love stability. And that's what's Tom. That's, that's what Tomlin's provided. I mean, if you make a change from Mike Tomlin, He's going to get hired within an hour of, yeah, of, of being seconds, on the market. Man. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. He's just, like phone's going to hang up. Phone's going to ring. I heard. Yeah. <laughs> like you, you don't, you don't move on from a a Hall of Fame caliber coach. Um, the guy wins consistently. Like I, I had this discussion with a friend the other day. He was praising Pete Carroll for the job he's done this year with the Seahawks post Russell Wilson. I'm like, yeah, it's fantastic. Guess who has a higher winning percentage historically than Pete Carroll? Mike Tomlin. Mm -hmm. Pete Carroll has more playoff wins in the last decade. I, I, I will give you that. You want to criticize Tomlin for the lack of playoff success. I'm all for it. But there has to be context with that we, lack of playoff success. We went 11 in. What was our season? What was our season when we um went 11 and 0? What was that? I can't that was that was 2020. They went 11 and 0 and fell off a cliff. Yeah. yeah and so like, what did what did what did we end with that year? Oh, was that 12 and 12 five? I think they finished because they lost in the wild yeah. card. Yeah, yeah. I mean, first so play of the game. That, like, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, going 11 and 0 doesn't necessarily happen. It's it's really wild. Um, giving the holes, they didn't even have a one game, you know? Yeah, like, they had, yeah, they had a quarterback coming off of major elbow surgery, you know? I like, like a team, I know that was a couple years ago, but I just think that's phenomenal to be able to figure out. And yes, give credit to that defense. And that's, we know that's Tom and strong suit, but I mean, I could talk about this all day. And like, it's know? just, it's, it's so frustrating. <laughs> and anytime, like anytime it comes up, I just point to the 2019 season. They lost Ben Roethlisberger six quarters yeah. into the year. And they went eight and eight with Mason Rudolph, who I like more than most. I think he can be a solid backup quarterback, but let's face it. He was not ready to be on the field that year. Mm -hmm. And then they brought Duck Hodges out of the CFL. Yeah. <laughs> like they, they went eight and eight. That's all you have to say to me. Yes. They had a loaded defense that year. You know, Minka Fitzpatrick came in and changed a lot about that team, but they won eight games with Duck Hodges and Mason Rudolph, a quarterback in a quarterback driven league with Benny Snell playing a lot of football in the backfield that year. Cause James Connor was hurt. Like, yep. It was that, crazy. And then mind you, Ben hadn't even won a game before he went out. Right. So it right. wasn't like he went out on a winning streak. Right. Tomlin had to win all of those games without Ben Roethlisberger. Yeah. People forget so, that. People so I just, I, I'm sick of hearing about it. Like yeah. I, I really want Tomlin 
to extend this streak because I think it's so impressive. Like yeah. with the amount of parity that there is in the NFL at this point where, I mean, my goodness, look at the Los Angeles Rams. They won the Super Bowl last year. Now and they're what? Uh, five and 10. Yeah. And like, completely fell from grace. Yeah. Like it, there's so much parity. And for that man to have this franchise consistently in contention in December, I, I can't ever say a bad word about him. I, I yeah. I'll say that the, the in-game stuff, can be frustrating. The clock management, some in-game decisions, when to go for it, when to punt, that can be frustrating. But there that's are not. Every, that's I think that's, that's almost every, every organization, yeah. right? That's not yes. something that's that's centered just around this particular being. That's football. You're not going to agree with everything that happens. You're yeah. not. You're not even in the headset to see who actually. You know, I, I know all everything falls on the head coach, but you don't know what's really going on. No, um, and and that's why I like watching that that Paramount Plus, the the NFL, uh, you know, inside yeah, the NFL, but, like the clip mm-hmm. that came out after the Christmas Eve game, the final mm-hmm. drive. He goes out there and he looks into the eyes of every offensive player and's like, "Let me see your face. Mm-hmm. Don't you know? Don't blink. Let let's have a grow up moment here." And they did. Like that man has, he he grabs the attention of every player on that roster from the star to the last guy on the practice squad. Like he has their attention. He has their respect. They compete for him. I don't know what more you could want out of your head coach. You can't. It's hard to win. Like, yeah, it's hard to win. If it were easy, you know, they probably wouldn't be playing the game if it were that easy, you know? So he, he just has the respect. He's a hall of fame head coach. And I so desperately want him to extend this streak just so the all off season, Anytime anyone complains about it, I can just say 16 years, never had a losing season. Like, look, look, I, look, how can you complain about that? And I, 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 that's what I don't understand. And when people say they'd rather have a championship and have their team stink for five, six years, like, okay. We don't do that. You don't even know what stinking looks like. You, right. really, like, you thought you thought we were going to stink, you know, yeah. and they found a way, not saying we're a phenomenal team, but you thought they figured out a way to come and win seven games after like, being two and whatever, three and whatever for so long. Like, don't forget, two and six, there's yeah. comments of trade Cam Hayward. Najee Harris is Trent Richardson 2.0. Like, and now I can't all of a sudden. That. The Najee bus stuff. That was exhausting. I, I was just livid. If you look at his numbers and his yards per carry, they were pretty much identical for what he would did the year before. And yeah, people it, were complaining. But. It was exhausting. The, the, it, the trade Cam Hayward thing, though, was probably the most. And, that, and this man has been playing like a 20 something year old yeah. <laughs> guy yeah. Yeah. Um, at, at his age right now. Like Cam Hayward is being a monster. This is somebody that you can see. Tomlin's influence on him like he's not giving up and he's leading this team um and I I love that for these guys on defense he's like look we gotta tighten up and I gotta I, I gotta get it done if it, it, it'll start with me so and, you know I'll be honest too like I know we're kind of off on a tangent here but yeah I think this is one of the more enjoyable Steeler teams that I've gotten a chance to cover like yeah you know the the killer bees they were fun they were explosive they had a lot of star power but it just felt like there was constantly drama, Mm -hmm. you know? And then with Ben Roethlisberger late in his career, all the attention was on Ben and the drama and, and, you know, how are they getting it done? Like that 11 and 0 season was exhausting because the entire time they were on that winning streak, people were, were questioning the Steelers and bashing Ben. And it's like, but they're winning football games this year. It just, it feels like it's a close knit group. There's a lot of, of guys to really root for, individually you know they got a lot of great character on the team and i I never have an issue with their yeah i I never have an issue with their compete level like i know every week that they go out there they're going to give 110 percent and they're going to battle and that's what's so enjoyable about this group like they're never out of a game yeah and okay i i know we uh we we had fun that was (laughs) That was a good I, time. I had to, listen, I had to get the Tomlin stuff off my no, chest. I'm just so tired. It. It. It's so it's so vital. I fight. I if you don't like Tomlin, just stay over there. Okay. Yeah. If, and if you feel like you need to be on, don't be on the fence with me. You here or you're not here. Yeah. You go root for the, the Browns. If you, yeah, I don't go, go root for the Browns if you are are out on Mike Tomlin. Like if you want to change the head coach, go root for the Browns and see what it's like to go through a head coach exactly. every two seasons. 
Mm -hmm. Get somebody else to do it because I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm not joining that bandwagon. But thank you again, Josh. I had so much fun having these conversations with you, man. <laughs> Tell everybody where they can find you online. Yeah. So on Twitter, I am at by Josh Carney right there uh, underneath my face. Uh, Steelers Depot, that's where I write almost every day uh, throughout the season. I know that we are we are closing in on the end of the regular season. I hope there's some playoff football, even if it might not be pretty for the Steelers. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm there yeah, every day. And, yeah, so. Everybody's going to be starting their mock drafts if they if not. <laughs> yeah, and then, dra you know, drafts. Draft Crazy Draft season rolls on. around fast. I, I will be I will be heading out to Vegas to represent Steelers Depot at the Shrine Bowl in late January. So uh okay. yeah, yeah. So there's awesome. there's there's gonna be a lot of stuff coming. But uh yeah, Steelers Depot is where you can find me and then on Twitter at by Josh Carney. And like I told you before, just a, a huge fan of your work. I uh, really appreciate you. you bringing me on here. And it's it's fun to just kind of to rant uh about yeah. Steelers football with you. Right. I appreciate you. We love everybody over at Steelers Depot. You guys are awesome. I uh, love what you do. And everyone's always sending me articles. And I'm like, oh, I know that person. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I love you guys. Happy holidays and happy new year to you, man. Thanks for coming through. Absolutely. Happy holidays. Happy new year to you as well. Thanks.